Good evening. My name is Todd Lake, Vice President for Spiritual Development at Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee. We're so glad you could join us for this very special event as part of Belmont University's Ideas of America programming to support the presidential debate that will be held on our campus tomorrow night, October 22nd. Before we go any further, let me take a moment to thank our debate sponsors, particularly HCA Healthcare, the City of Nashville, the Nashville Convention and Visitors Corporation, and Ryman Hospitality Properties. We are so grateful to them and the many other sponsors you'll find on our belmontdebate2020.com website for making events like this possible. When Belmont hosted the 2008 presidential town hall debate, our speaker the night before the debate pointed out that while both candidates talked a lot about the middle class, almost nothing was being said about the poor. Tonight, we want to again take a look at the radical Christian idea that because everyone is made in the image of God, and because Jesus taught us to pray our Father, every person has a claim on our love and concern. Our speaker tonight will share his vision of ensuring that in our country and our world, there is a home for everyone. Jonathan Reckford is the CEO of Habitat for Humanity International, a global Christian housing organization that has helped more than 29 million people construct, rehabilitate, or preserve their homes. Since 2005, when he took the top leadership position, local Habitat organizations in all 50 states and in more than 70 countries have grown from serving 125,000 individuals each year to helping more than 7 million people annually. He says, we should take on God-sized tasks because then it is clear to everyone who deserves the credit. Jonathan attended UNC Chapel Hill, where he received a Henry Luce scholarship, which enabled him to do marketing work for the Seoul Olympic Organizing Committee and coach the Korean rowing team in preparation for the 1988 Olympics. It was thanks to friends he made there that he began a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. 
Jonathan earned his MBA from the Stanford University Graduate School of Business before spending much of his career in the for-profit sector, including executive and managerial positions at Marriott, the Walt Disney Company, and Best Buy. While serving as executive pastor at Christ Presbyterian Church near Minneapolis, Minnesota, he was recruited for the CEO position at Habitat. He serves on the board of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta and is, on, is a member of the Freddie Mac Housing Advisory Council, the Council on Foreign Relations, and the Urban Steering Committee for the World Economic Forum. Named the most influential nonprofit leader in America in 2017 by the Nonprofit Times, Jonathan is the author of Our Better Angels, Seven Simple Virtues That Will Change Your Life and Our World. Let me welcome uh, very warmly Jonathan Reckford, the CEO of Habitat for Humanity International. Jonathan, we're a thrill to have you with us. We wish you could have you here in person, but we're so thankful you can join us uh, virtually tonight. Thanks so much, Todd. Thank you for the gracious introduction. It is wonderful to be with all of you. I wish so much we could be together in person, but I'm thankful that technology allows us to come together in a different way. You might expect me to give a talk just about housing, and I can't pass up the opportunity to point out how critical housing is to every aspect of society. If you care about health, you have to care about housing. If you're passionate about education, you have to acknowledge the link between a stable home and better education outcomes. If you care about racial equity, you have to examine housing policies as we seek to create systems of racial injustice. But I wanna focus on a different idea today since we're gathered in connection with a presidential debate. I want to talk about one of the issues at the heart of Habitat for Humanity's mission, and that's bringing people together. How are Christians called to engage in politics in this very divisive environment? Whether it's in the books I'm reading, debates outside this election, or conversations I engage in daily, the same theme keeps emerging. We can do better than this. Francis Collins, director of the National Institutes of Health, is a geneticist who led the Human Genome Project and is a follower of Jesus. He won the 2020 Templeton Prize, which celebrates scientific and spiritual curiosity. And this, in his recent acceptance speech entitled, I'm Praise in Praise of Harmony, he said the following. Polarized views drive politicians to adopt polarized positions. And we devolve into tribes. We stop trusting each other. We infer all sorts of bad motivations to those not of our own tribe, even as we forgive our own glaring inconsistencies. Editor and author David French warns against partisan allegiances that don't match Christian moral imperatives. He urges that we prioritize truth over tribe because our commitment to Christ is eternal, but our commitment to a party or politician is ephemeral. It's amazing how much more truth you'll learn by seeking out the best opposing arguments, he says. I believe that too many people have become so entrenched with their own side that they defend the indefensible from their team and refuse to acknowledge good from those who do not support their positions. In fact, Arthur Brooks says in his book, Love Your Enemies, that following the 2016 US election, one in six Americans had stopped talking to a family member or close friend. We don't have an anger problem in American politics, Brooks said. We have a contempt problem. And anger plus disgust leads to contempt. Could you be persuaded to change by someone who holds you in contempt? No. Transformation, like every positive action, happens in relationship. At Habitat for Humanity, I'm privileged to see incredible transformation that occurs when ordinary people come together around the world to help families build or improve their homes. Do we agree on every issue? Of course not. When I started Habitat more than 15 years ago, both former President Jimmy Carter and the late uh, Congressman and HUD Secretary Jack Kemp served on our board of directors. They would never agree on everything about economic policy. But they cared deeply about our work and were motivated by their faith. 
when Kemp debated Al Gore in the vice presidential debates in 1996, when egged on by the interviewer, Kemp said, we don't see Al Gore and Bill Clinton as our enemy. We see them as our opponents. Abraham Lincoln put it best when he said, you serve your party best by serving the nation first. So this call for civility is nothing new, but it is an imperative that we cannot abandon. It's okay if we don't agree on how we get things done, but at Habitat, we believe that everyone can agree on the fact that no one should be living in desperate poverty. That's been our strength for, for more than four decades. I've had the great privilege of building all over the world with young and old, executives and laborers, blacks and whites in South Africa, Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland, Hindus and Muslims in India, Muslims and Christians in Egypt. I have even had the opportunity to build with Democrats and Republicans. So anything is possible with God. We believe that every child is created in God's image and should have the opportunity to grow up to be all that God intended. When many people think of Habitat, they conjure up images of volunteers raising the walls of a house on a Saturday morning. We long for the days when we can get everyone safely back on the work site. Fewer people, however, know that Habitat was founded by a committed group of people seeking to live out their Christian faith. We choose to provide shelter as our means of demonstrating the love of Jesus and help families improve their living conditions in response to the many biblical directives to love one another. We reject the idea that we have to choose between being faithful and being inclusive. Both are deeply held core values at Habitat. As we often say, God is our center, not our border. Our motivation for the work is to put God's love into action in a tangible way. And we joyfully welcome anyone who wants to come help improve their community. I contend that you can't explain the success of Habitat without God. It's so unlikely that from a prayer gathering on a farm in Southwest Georgia in the 60s, it has led to over 29 million people obtaining new or improved housing all across the world. Our ministry continues to be blessed and to be a blessing in ways far beyond all we could imagine. The idea for caring for others in this world was an oft repeated message I heard as far back as I can remember. One of the most influential people in my life was my grandmother. Her name was Millicent Fenwick. She was a New Jersey Congresswoman who was committed to issues of social justice and human rights. She was not your stereotypical grandmother and was never timid about speaking strongly on behalf of those in need. She was the model for Gary Trudeau's Doonesbury character, Lacey Davenport. If you're not familiar, Google it, it's worth a look. She also wrote the best-selling Vogue Book of Etiquette in 1947. So in order to graduate to the grown-up table at her house, one had to be able to sit up straight, hold your fork properly, and discuss food problems in Sub-Saharan Africa, both fascinating and terrifying as a 10-year-old. Grandma had a very imposing presence. What I remember most is that every time I saw her, she would challenge my brothers and sisters and me to be useful. She would also recite to us what she called her life verse from the Bible, Micah 6, 8. He has showed you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. That passage of scripture and my grandmother's unconventional determination to fight for social justice were profound influences on my life. I like that word useful because it's not just about doing something good or about filling your time productively. It's about work that connects you to others. It's about finding your place as a part of something bigger than yourself. I'll admit it took me a long time to find my path to usefulness. After college, I'd planned to get a law degree and go into politics, but I realized I had no interest in practicing law. So despite being a pol political science major, after graduation, I talked my way into a job as a financial analyst at Goldman Sachs. I spent super long hours every day working on huge deals. And when I headed home to my tiny apartment in Times Square, I'd pass by so many people experiencing homelessness. 
people for whom a single dollar was the difference between eating and going hungry. I didn't feel useful, so I quit after two years. After a life-changing year in Korea, I spent the next decade and a half in a variety of corporate executive jobs with increasing responsibilities. Experiencing both success and failure, I learned something at each of them. And then the company I was helping lead was acquired and I soon became unemployed. With a generous severance package and a ferocious non-compete clause, I was extremely lucky to be able to spend more time with my family. I found it was difficult to let go of an identity that was tied too much to my occupation. People asked me what I did. I felt like they dismissed me, so I was tempted to answer in terms of what I used to do. There were times along the way when I wondered if I'd made the right decision. So in an effort to learn and serve, I traveled to India. I was working alongside the Dalits, the outcast class pejoratively called untouchables. Among the Dalits, the Bangi are the poorest, most marginalized group in India. The only jobs they are allowed to do are hand cleaning latrines and cleaning up after dead animals in rural areas. Without some intervention when I visited, half of the children in those communities were dying before the age of 13. Even the names given to Dalit children are heart-wrenching. Usually it's only one word, a word that's a pejorative, and a label each child carries around to proclaim the misfortune of being born into an unthinkable situation. I hated that. Seeing children living in those conditions devastated me. I was convicted by the poverty I saw both abroad and at home. I felt what the spiritual father of Habitat, Clarence Jordan, called divine irritation, when injustice can no longer be ignored and you're driven to act. That led to more volunteering, including coaching pastors and helping churches grow. That led to an unexpected invitation to take a full-time leadership role in my church. My friends and everyone I trusted for career advice said this was career suicide. But however, as, as my wife Ashley and I prayed about it, it seemed to be what I was supposed to do. It turned out that I loved working for the church and it was exactly what I needed looking back to be ready when Habitat came calling out of the blue a couple of years later. I could have designed my perfect job. It would have been something like Habitat for Humanity, a global Christian mission empowering families and communities. So when a recruiter called asking for recommendations for someone who might be able to lead Habitat for Humanity, I remember a shiver running down my spine. To my great surprise, I got the job. For the last 15 years, I can honestly say there's nothing I would rather be doing, despite some very difficult days along the way. I came in with my 100-day plan, and I was going to go around the world and visit and learn from the different country programs and offices. Um, and then just a few days before I was supposed to start, Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Rita hit the United States, and that changed everything. We were already trying to recover from the huge Indian Ocean tsunami that had devastated countries across the Indian Ocean Basin. Suddenly there was no business as usual. Destruction demanded that we think not just in terms of building houses, but of impacting entire communities and regions. We drastically changed our ideas of what was possible and found bold new ways to scale up our work. In the years following, Habitat served an estimated 25,000 families in the Asia Pacific region and 6,000 families uh, we helped build back along the US Gulf Coast. That was the beginning of what seemed like an endless stream of man made natural disasters that our world has faced. One that continues to haunt me was Hurricane Harvey, the 2017 storm that pounded the Houston area with 130 mile an hour winds. 60 inches of rain fell in only five days as a storm cell hovered relentlessly over the area. Flooding affected 13 million people and damaged or destroyed more than 200,000 homes. I visited the area shortly after and met Vicki and her nine-year-old daughter, Aaliyah. They just wanted to put their lives back together. The first thing that struck me as I was ripping out drywall and trim in Aaliyah's room, which had been flooded, was the jumble of ruined possessions strewn on the floor. Stuffed animals, playing cards, math workbooks, and a basketball. Vicki wanted us to try to save her dishes and whatever shoes we could, which we carefully did along with a few family photos. 
realize that this family and so many others were going to have to start over. I told her that Habitat would be there and that we would walk alongside her and the other families for as long as it takes. And the recovery can take years. For all the trauma they inflict, catastrophes also have the power to strip our pretenses away. They remind us of what truly matters. They forge connection and community. Shortly after the rain stopped in Houston, President Carter authored an op-ed comparing the disaster response to the world he once knew, a world where you counted on your neighbors and they counted on you. In it, he wrote, when the water rises, so do our better angels. He's right. From stories of uncommon kindness and heroism after 9-11 to the more than half a million volunteers who came to the Gulf Coast after Katrina, to individuals who are taking care of their neighbors isolated by the coronavirus, catastrophes inspire our better angels to rise. In his article, President Carter also wrote, the way we respond to a disaster should be a template for the way that we respond to each other every day. It really could be that simple and that profound. Helping families improve their living conditions and build a better life, I know I get to be useful. I feel it every day. Our mission statement sums it up well. Seeking to put God's love into action, Habitat for Humanity brings people together to build homes, communities, and hope. Let me tell you about some unlikely people who came together through Habitat's ministry. In Egypt, we had partnered in a community a few hours south of Cairo, and the imam, the local Muslim worship leader, uh, it was his turn to get a new home, to build a new home. After his house was complete, we were going to begin work on a neighboring family that turned out to be Christian, but construction couldn't start until their previous home was demolished. That meant the family was going to be homeless for three months. Despite initial feelings of discomfort, the imam took the family in and shared his home with them for those 90 days. His Christian neighbor had been such a positive force in the community that he wanted to respond in kind. He told me that the love he was shown by Habitat was so profound that he wanted to offer it to others. Similar story about people of different faiths coming together took place in Durham, North Carolina, not quite so far away. Organizers of a project that included both a Jewish and Christian congregation scheduled a Sunday build so that the congregation of Bethel Synagogue could participate. The day before, however, a gunman had shot and killed 11 congregants at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. Several people wondered if it would be appropriate to work on the home, which would be purchased by a Muslim family. The synagogue decided that the best response to such a tragedy was to come together in the community and love one another. So work on the home proceeded. There they were, a group of Jews and Christians and Muslims working side by side to build a home with Muslim immigrants from Saudi Arabia and Sudan. Volunteers didn't dwell on what had happened the day before. They focused on the strength and compassion of their community. I often feel like I'm moving between two worlds. There's the world of the national news, a place where tragedy headlines and fear and discord rule. And then there's the world of habitat, a place where one of the ways we define success is how we help each other, how deeply we connect to those we serve. Another of our favorite volunteers who's one of my heroes is Archbishop Desmond Tutu. He said it so well at a bill he sponsored in South Africa. He said, as the physical walls of the home go up, the invisible walls that separate us as people come tumbling down and hope is built in the community. My prayer is that the world will choose this model of servant leadership. I hope that people of faith around the world will rise up and commit to being truth seekers who are eager to have respectful conversations and learn from one another. And for each of us, that always has to start with me. We're called to be involved in politics in the sense that we should advocate for our neighbors, seek justice for everyone, and work to create thriving and inviting communities for all. Sounds a lot like Micah 6-8.
I now realize that my grandmother wanted me to be useful because she knew my life would be better and brighter, that I would more fully experience a world of hope if I had genuine compassion for others. Because I need to feel that connection. We all do. The truth is that for every trial, whether it's a natural disaster or an occasion where human beings have kept others from living into all that God intended, each of us is being is called to be a light in the darkness. When we help each other, we get a glimpse into the kingdom of God on earth. So I wanna echo my grandmother today and ask, how will you be useful? What will you do to make the world better? We can choose to let anger, cynicism, and hurt divide us, or we can commit to call upon the virtues that come so naturally in times of trial to guide us through the mundane moments as well. Our individual efforts will make a difference. Our collective efforts can change the world. It's just great to be with you all. And I think now we're gonna have a chance to have more of a dialogue. So I welcome your comments and questions. And I think Todd is gonna jump in at this point and, uh, and facilitate us. Well, I, I have to thank you from the bottom of my heart. That was inspiring, informative. Uh, I've certainly been involved with Habitat for a lot of years in different ways. My wife used to serve on a, the board up in Boston and, and we've participated in a number of builds, but this was really, really moving. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And we look forward to getting you on campus in person once uh, the pandemic allows and having you uh, get a chance to inspire us in person as well. Uh, initial question, um, in the, the conversations around homelessness in our country, uh, there's been a shift in the last few years and people have now begun to say the first thing people need is a home. Uh, and uh, how has Habitat been engaged with that process of helping people find uh, find a home? And, and by the way, let me mention, we have a number of questions have come in as well, uh, even as I've been speaking, but let me invite those of you who are watching to please feel free uh, to post a question to the Q&A and I'll, I'll take care of that for Jonathan and we'll we'll get those asked and in due course. But Jonathan, about the, the homeless, the house, it sounds simple, but the house being step one, not the last step, but the first step. You know, it's, it's, you're exactly right. And the data is overwhelmingly clear. If you think about the, the prior model, the model was get your life together, clean up everything, and then we'll give you housing. It's the equivalent of saying, once you're perfect, you can come to church. It's, uh, it would be a very empty building. And so what we found is if you can move people into housing and then surround them with services and support and community, that has been infinitely more effective and, and turns out to be much more cost effective as well. But it's getting that, that engine started. So Habitat, if you think of the continuum of housing from supportive housing, all the way to affordable rental, to market rate rental, to uh, home ownership. Habitat's sort of unique niche is affordable home ownership, but we can be part of the process. So for example, we've had partnerships in communities with the Salvation Army, where once people have gained supportive housing and gotten stable and are in the right position, then they can become candidates to purchase a home and become homeowners. So we, we want to create that pathway towards permanence as we talk about it. Uh, so it is, we still believe you know, as I said right at the beginning, that um, housing certainly isn't the only need, but in many ways it's a prerequisite. And if you pull housing out, you don't get the educational health and, uh, and job outcomes that we want. And so I think, you know, affordable housing doesn't have the best brand, but if you think about it, all of us want affordable housing. And uh, for some of the students, you may, Nashville is a great example, it used to be a very affordable place. Now, a lot of uh, students and people with decent incomes still can't afford the housing because costs have gone up so fast. Right. M Millard Fuller, as you know, uh, uh, your predecessor and the founder of Habitat used to say, um, a lot of people can afford one house, but very uh, pay for one house, but very few people can afford to pay for three houses. And that's what you wind up paying when you pay a mortgage over 30 years. Uh, but of course, the homeless, they don't have the nest egg or necessarily the income stream. How do you deal with that? Because the, the traditional Habitat model has been um, the, for the working poor, not the poorest of the poor, but the yeah. working poor, as I understand it. And, and that's still the case. So where we would do it in two ways, one is we do advocacy work and policy work. And there we really try to support the entire spectrum of housing. So we're actually in the midst of our first ever U.S. housing campaign called Cost of Home. And it's really focused on the fact that there are 18 million families paying over half their income on housing. And if you think about that, there's just not enough money for 
everything else. We're also facing a potential eviction cliff with coronavirus. And so we have a huge number of people who are at risk of losing their homes or losing their uh, rented apartments. And we know if a child gets evicted uh, and has to switch schools, they can lose up to a year of academic progress. So it becomes this rolling tragedy. So we are very involved from the policy side of supporting all the elements of housing. We think the, the area that is underserved still is the chance for home ownership. And if you think about it, most families historically that have been able to move into the middle class, often housing was the vehicle to create an intergenerational asset over time through the savings of, of purchasing a home. And the way that Habitat has dealt with that is instead of having to pay a cash down payment, families put in sweat equity, as we call it, and they take classes in home maintenance and finance so that they're really well prepared by the time they close and purchase the home. And then they pay back an affordable mortgage and those payments recycle in the community. And that model uh, has been incredibly effective over the years. We do a partnership with one of the premier homeless ministries in Nashville called Room in the Inn. Mm. And uh, we have a Belmont owned home where people after they graduate from a two year program at Room in the Inn uh, live and they're ready to go out on their own, but they don't have the money to do it. And so they save their money while they're working. They live uh, cost free in this Belmont owned home, uh, which has three been subdivided to form three apartments. And the very first person who moved into that moved from there into a habitat home. And so it was thanks to you that uh, that Joe got a got a got a place to live. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, it's a, it's a shining story. I, actually, I talked about all these different divides in our world. I actually think the toughest divide in our country right now is the economic divide, and the coronavirus has exacerbated that dramatically with this K economy, or at the Fed they taught, they called it the less than economy. If you think about a you know the mathematical less than sign. So those mm -hmm. of us who have assets and knowledge jobs can work from home. It's inconvenient, but it's all fine. For those who have service jobs and are out in front, this is a catastrophe. And so uh, I think it is just so more critical than ever uh, that we make sure that we are supporting uh, those who don't have the chance. Because if you don't have assets, it's really hard to build assets. And we also see, sadly, a racial component to that where um, there's been disproportionate impact of coronavirus on uh, Blacks and people of color. And similarly, if you look at housing, the home ownership rates are dramatically different. And in many ways that came from, uh, you know, historical decisions by the federal government uh, exacerbated by local zoning that basically forced segregation and, uh, and all the lending went to the quote better neighborhoods. That's, what, that's where redlining came from. And therefore lots and lots of families from the 50s through the, the 80s built up the assets to be able to send their kids to college, to be able to move into the middle class. And that was denied to an awful lot of people simply because of, of race. And that's where Habitat helps subvert that narrative in a, in a very healthy way. Uh, let me post one of the questions. That's what I'm supposed to do. I just forget to do that. Um, how do you, and this touches on something you just referenced, how do you balance the belief that the poor should be housed and live to their full t potential, right? With the understanding that only, <laughs> little contentious here, one party seems to prioritize that with government spending. And you referenced your, uh, your uh, grandmother, right? Uh, Millicent Fenwick, and uh, I believe she was Republican. She uh, was. And she was. Uh, uh, kind of a Rockefeller Republican, for those who know their political history, um, that that uh, that may not be as, as uh, true today, that there is the breadth of ideological uh, perspective in each of the parties. They tend to have migrated to the extremes a little bit more, perhaps. So how, how, how do you deal with trying to be apolitical in a politicized world? Yeah, you know, I think it gets harder, but we're deeply committed. And I, I said, I say that quite often. They say, you know, are you political? And the answer is yes, we're political because we think the government has a role, as does the private sector, as does civil society in solving housing. And in fact, really complex things can only be solved by public, private, and civil society coming together. If you think about the great knotty challenges of of our world. Um, and I think what a, a wise person told me, I think it's really helpful to think about this is one thing to do is separate the solution from the problem and deal with one at a time. So first we could all agree, it's not acceptable that 18 million people are paying over half their income for housing. Mm -hmm. And that there's a moral imperative, there's a theological imperative, um, and there's a practical economic imperative. Because if you see the extreme, like a San Francisco, if no one making less than $200,000 can live in San Francisco, that's not sustainable. That will ultimately melt down 
both politically and economically. And so the question is, we know the data would say the best for everyone are to create mixed income, mixed use cities where people can live and work close, uh, close by. That's better for the environment, that's better for their families, and, it's, uh, and we can all win with that. Then you could have an honest debate about what's the best way to achieve that. And you could have a more conservative stance that says, you know what, if you create dependence, that's not healthy and there are better ways to do it. I would argue it has to start with compassion and then what are the best ways? Habitat uh, has historically had great support from both parties. And you know, historically, Republicans have been pro-housing and pro-home ownership, and Democrats have been pro-housing and pro-support. And so I do think um, there is room, though it's getting harder, to bring people together for a bipartisan uh, solutions. And, and I think we have to do that, and we have to keep trying. And the good news for us is you know, we're in every congressional district, and so uh, we have good friends in both parties and can try to at least push, but it is certainly harder than it used to be. There used to be, um, well, I think about Jim Cooper, your wonderful local congressman, mm -hmm. uh, who was one of my fraternity brothers long ago, is, uh, you know, an example. There used to be lots more like Jim who were moderate Democrats, and there used to be a lot like my grandmother of moderate Republicans. So there used to be you had lots of Democrats who were more conservative than the most liberal Republicans and vice versa. Uh, that really has has not happened as much now. So we're going to have to fight harder to build the coalitions. Uh, but I still think it's possible. And my hope is um, it's it's going to be possible because people like the students here are going to ask it of their of their public servants. And I think what's interesting to me is we've seen housing finally get more visible. And in my slightly more jaded view of that, it's because now the children of middle class families can't find housing when they get out of school. So it's visible suddenly as it gets more and more expensive and maybe people can make more attention. But it is, and, and our view is, is what we want to do is have is demonstrate practical solutions that can work. And, and obviously Habitat is not the only answer and we need a whole array of solutions. But I think the principles that underlie Habitat work really well. Um, Clarence Jordan, who's, who's the godfather of Habitat, the pastor who came up with the idea, he was so far ahead of his time. So he founded an interracial farm in 1942 in rural Southwest Georgia. That was way ahead of his time. Not very welcome in the 60s when he pulled a group together to pray and think about the idea, which later turned into the Fund for Humanity, which became Habitat for Humanity. He had a wonderful quote in this extraordinary letter that came out of this week of prayer. And what he said is the poor, what the poor need is not charity, but capital, not case workers, but co-workers. And what the rich need is a wise, honorable, and just way of divesting themselves of their overabundance. And he had a vision that everyone had something to gain and something to give when they came together. And that idea of partnership, I think, is what's so desperately needed. And that's not a Republican or a Democrat view. That is, a, I think, that's a, it's a very much a biblical view of community. We talked a bit about the polarization, increasing polarization in politics. Has there been an increasing polarization in the churches that has had a negative impact on Habitat or has Habitat continued to find a way to bridge the gap between, uh, for one of better terms, left and right in the, in the theological world? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say um, we have not had that challenge. And it doesn't mean that we have churches that are filled with people who would not agree with each other on many, many things. But the good news is I actually think serving in the community is something that goes across kind of the political spectrum and the religious spectrum. I love when we do interfaith builds and I talked about one example. I joke that there are places in the United States where the interfaith build means the Methodists, the Baptists and the Catholics come together and build. That's not really what we think of as, as interfaith versus sort of an Abraham build with, uh, with mosques, synagogues and churches coming together. Um, but I do believe that coming out and doing service together is a way to build relationship out of shared value. And when you can build relationship and trust, then you can have hard conversations. And suddenly it's not those people who are evil and my enemy. It's like, well, I met them. You know, I had a dinner with journalist Jim Fallows a while back and I really enjoyed his book. And what um, he had an observation is he traveled through small and medium sized towns all over the country with his wife and he said, if you raise national politics, everyone's IQ dropped 30 points instantly. But if you just talked about what's going on in the community, people who might be anti-immigration sort of at a federal level are totally welcoming of the immigrants in their community because they're real people, it's personal, right? So I think the Habitat's mission is housing, but one of the aspects I love about Habitat is it can make these issues personal for people in a way that can hopefully become transformational.
and people literally working together on a project. And that's how you, that's someone said, <laughs> ministry colleague of mine said, do you mean fellowship eating pizza together or fellowship doing something to serve together? And fellowship doing something to serve together is the kind that really does knit hearts together, doesn't it? I think that's the, that is absolutely the answer. And I think it's, it's the way the church demonstrates its relevance in the community, mm -hmm. which I think is so critically important. But I also believe that it is, um, I had a great conversation with Bill Urey, who co-wrote Getting to Yes, the famous negotiation book, and he led the Harvard Negotiation Project. He's done a lot of international uh, reconciliation work, uh, post-war and other uh, deep conflicts. And someone introduced us, we had a great conversation. He was saying, one of his theses is, if you have a really tough negotiation, don't sit across the table from one another, go for a walk, because then you're shoulder to shoulder, you're looking the same way, you're... Uh, you're aligned in a different way. And he said, even better, go build a habitat house together because the fact that you're literally working on something together that forces you to cooperate, that forces you to do something that appeals to both of your shared values creates the basis uh, for, for real relationship. Amen. Amen. Um, habitat exists uh, around the world. I have heard that there are some countries where habitat exists, but because uh, of the government policies, they don't actually need to build much housing in that country and they send teams to other countries. Is, is that true or is that just a happy rumor? No, that, that is true. I mean, the most, extre the, the most extreme example of that is Habitat Singapore. Um, if, if Singapore probably is the only country in the world that actually has enough housing for all its citizens. Um, now it's, it's unreplicable because it's a city state with authoritarian control and it's benevolent. So they have actually mandated mixed income, mixed use housing and built enough and they can restrict who comes in. So all of those factors are, are hard to change. And Habitat Singapore, what they do is a little bit of work repairing and cleaning up and helping the elderly who may not be able to maintain their apartments uh, or their housing in the city, but mostly they raise money for uh, lower income parts of, of Asia and, uh, and Africa. And similarly, um, our, our goal is um, to part of my heart is to get as much money to the highest need parts of the world as possible. Mm -hmm. But the reality is we have housing shortages everywhere. So it can be a both and, but we do have more fundraising countries that are sending countries. And then we have uh, countries that are both building. And, uh, and in, in some ways, the beautiful part of Habitat is, is we have a program called uh, that we have a tithe program so that uh, Nashville Habitat raises money and they send a small portion of that money overseas to build in, uh, in higher need areas. And in fact, it started because our first country um, was in uh, the DRC back then, uh, Zaire. And after they received money from the US, they were so inspired that they tithed off the money they got to help start Habitat Guatemala. And that began this, this tradition of, uh, of funds flowing from one part of the world to another, which I think is, is lovely. We have about another 15 minutes. So I'm going to try to get a bunch of these questions on the on the table for us. Um, here's one from DJ Carr. I know personally that Hurricane Harvey affected a lot of families and their homes. How do you feel about the already large homeless community in Houston? Hmm. You know, I think it's a huge challenge. And Houston, in some ways, is more affordable than most cities because they've made it relatively easy to build and, and it's not that expensive to build. And yet it's still a huge challenge, right? And then the natural disasters come on top of what is already a supply problem. So, you know, to me, um, not having enough housing is a problem everywhere. And uh, I wouldn't want to single out Houston for being worse than others. Obviously, you know, when you had the level of devastation of Harvey, that's, you can't pull 200,000 units out and then quickly uh, come back. And so it takes years to, to build back. But I do believe, and this goes back to sort of the founding ethos of Habitat, that Ultimately, this is a this is not a matter of money; it's a matter of will. You know, there is enough money in our country to solve housing. We just have to have the willpower to do it and the willingness to do it. Um, and but it's not. I don't pretend it's easy. So in some ways, the solution has to be enough people of compassion um, making it a priority to to deal with it. And I think that's going to take uh, private sector and philanthropy, but also clearly take government funding too. Uh, no one group could solve it by themselves. Well, this next question follows right up on that. Uh, it says, I do think that serving people is a great way to bring people who are different together. Is there a limit to personal generosity and breaking down systems that perpetuate poverty? How is Habitat trying to treat the cause uh, of the lack of housing? 
Yeah, no, it's a really good question. Thank you. Because, and, and this did change our strategy. So some 12 years ago, we started looking at how fast we were growing. We we're growing pretty fast. And then we calculated against the 1.6 billion people at that point needing housing around the world. It, we, we calculated how long it would take and it was going to take over a thousand years. And we thought, well, that's, that's, that's too long. <laughs> so the, we changed the framing question, which went from a hard question, how many houses can we build? That was a good question to a really scarier question, which is what would it take to meaningfully reduce the housing deficit in all the geographies that we serve, which is scarier, but then forces you to start thinking about systems. And so this led us in two directions. One, historically, we'd stayed away from government. And this said, we have to impact policy because local government controls land zoning. And that's a huge both impediment or opportunity in terms of, of housing. And then the federal government clearly is critical to funding. Uh, for housing and prioritization. So we started looking country by country at the barriers that stop people from improving their own housing. And if you think about it, uh, it started with land rights. So it, it's hard for us to imagine in the US, but there are especially women and marginalized groups all over the world who may have lived on their land for decades, but don't have the legal right. And that means they can't borrow against it. They don't have an asset. They could have it taken away. There are places where if a a woman, uh, we had a great example in Bolivia where women didn't have the right to own property. And then you could imagine if divorce, inheritance, abuse, um, they could lose everything if they lost their husband. And so we actually had the, an incredible group of Bolivian women got together in Habitat, uh, got funding to sponsor and support and train them. And they not only got right to their own land, they got the federal law changed so that if a man owns a home and he's married, the home or land has to be joint titled. And so you think about that empowered 1.8 million women suddenly to be at property owners and, and asset holders. And so that, that's a tangible example. So the first step is, is property rights. The second step was access to finance. In most countries that we serve, only the wealthy could get a traditional bank mortgage. So what well, we started um, an experiment at first and now become a global leader in housing microfinance, getting microfinance banks to make small home improvement loans to very low income families on an unsecured basis. And what we've done now through partnerships and then through we raised a $100 million wholesale fund that we've been lending capital out to microfinance banks. And the repayment rates are just as good or higher than the small business loans. And that's allowed us to start helping millions of families upgrade their housing uh, through finance. And then the next step was going to building materials and skilled trades and uh, reducing that barrier. So we created the Center for Innovation and Shelter where we are actually investing alongside private sector entrepreneurs who are coming up with better building products for low income families to try to get those products to market. And then we are training up and supporting through our shelter tech ventures, these entrepreneurs and, and market players, and then creating things like apps and ratings within communities where you could find a skilled Mason uh, who is properly trained and can do a uh, proper build for you in your community. So what we're trying to do is impact the entire housing value chain in a way that if we're successful, more and more people can upgrade their own housing rather than needing someone to come in and do it for them. And, and to me, that's that starts to leverage because to the original point of the question, philanthropy alone is clearly insufficient. There's no country without government uh, engagement that has managed housing. And you know, in a way, though it's gotten reduced now, one of the ironies in the United States is that about two thirds of all the expenditures on housing from the federal government went to the middle class and the rich in the form of the mortgage interest deduction. And we don't think of that as welfare. We think of that as an entitlement, right? But then people get very upset when the government spends money on people in real need uh, supporting their housing. So it's, uh, I think the government has a role to play, but, but I don't believe the government uh, role is by itself sufficient and it's gonna take a, a multi-sector approach. Very good. Let me um, go to another question here that focuses on the fact that Habitat doesn't build houses and then say, here, poor person, here's a free house for you, uh, which I think is part of the genius of it. Um, this is one of the great things about Habitat is the focus on personal dignity of those receiving homes. Can you speak to the mindset and how it shapes the ongoing work of Habitat? You've done that already in some significant ways here with the multi-layered approach you talked about, but anything you'd like to add to that about the dignity of the person? I think it's really important. And I, I appreciate the question because I think that dignity is important. One of the, we are huge believers in charity. You know, we obviously raise a lot of philanthropy, but one of the insidious aspects of charity, if you're not careful, is that it can create a psychological distance that somehow the people giving the money are better than the people receiving, or it can create a sense of dependence or, 
or inequity in a different way. And so dignity is really important. And I, I gave that Clarence Jordan quote, but I think that idea that the family is getting a hand up, that they are, we all need a hand up. None of us can do this by ourselves. And they're given the opportunity, but they're still, they own it, they're buying it. We talk about them as not as recipients, but as home buyers. Uh, they have to qualify, they have to clean up their credit, they've got to put in sweat equity, they have to buy it and pay back their mortgage. So it is a partnership. And I think that sense of partnership is crucial and, and holding on to that idea, certainly in God's economy, that everyone is both a, a recipient and a giver. And in some ways, because we're recipients of radical grace. Um, that we don't deserve, we should surely be able to extend grace to others, uh, you know, it, as Tim Keller would so well say. Yeah, and um, this is similar to an earlier question. If you want to expand on that, that's fine. Uh, does collective effort have to mean non-governmental effort? Can you collectivize, can our collective taxes not be the effort that helps and sustains the poor too. And then the person said, yeah. parenthetically, I'm, I'm sure it's both and. And you have talked uh, about that, but anything you'd like to add to the way that, and, and, and honestly, up until you just spoke to us, I was unaware of the multi-layered approach you're now taking. I think in the early days, it was fairly yeah. straightforward what Habitat did, but you're working, it seems on every level. So a little bit more about that may be of interest to all of us. Yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great question. And we have this debate with Europeans all all the time because there's less philanthropy in Europe and more of a sense of I pay high taxes so the government should take care of these things. I think the only hole in that, and that's why something distinctive about the US that I don't want to lose and in some ways has been infectious spreading around the world is the idea that, um, that everyone should be personally involved. The, the danger of saying I pay my taxes, therefore I'm done and I don't need to care is not only is that not great for the rest of the community, it's not great for individuals. And I think we find joy and purpose and engagement by being fully involved in our communities. So I, I actually, I do think it's a both and, but I think there's something really powerful about getting personally engaged. And so I think of us as sort of leveraged philanthropy, uh, which is we do raise money, but we also get the mortgage repayments. And then we run this chain, you have them in Nashville of Habitat for Humanity Restores. So we have mm -hmm. nearly a thousand of these retail stores and mostly in the US and Canada. And that uh, last year was about a $540 million business. And the funds from that uh, flow back in to help build more houses locally. And actually, and along with that, keep a couple hundred thousand tons of what would be thrown away out of landfills. So it's a lovely kind of triple bottom line social enterprise that supports the, the Habitat mission. So I, I think it can be, um, in my view, what we need all over the country are more gatherings where we get home builders and bankers and mayors and housing, public housing people sitting with civil society and leaders from the communities themselves. It has to start with the voices of the community and then coming together and saying, what would it take to meaningfully increase the supply of housing? And it's gonna take changes in zoning, which has to be a government piece. It's gonna take financing, which is gonna be a combination. It's gonna take building prowess, which I think the private sector actually does much better than the public sector. And I think it takes civil society, which brings the voice of the community into the mix. Because if you have public-private partnerships and leave out people, we often say it shouldn't be a PPP, it should be that fourth P. So we need public-private people partnerships. And that's the critical role civil society can play in that mix. So you don't end up, which we've seen around the world, of the government contracting out to private builders and they build houses where no one wants to live because it hasn't been done as a community, uh, as a community process. So um, I think, uh, none of those sectors are sufficient. Philanthropy is clearly not sufficient. And one could argue that what philanthropy ought to do is take the highest risk to demonstrate what can really work so that then government and private sector can take it to, to a scale that can't be done by, um, by, the, by nonprofits alone. You, um, yeah, you, you talked about the importance of mixed use housing and mixed use neighbor or mixed income neighborhoods. I mean, a number of times in, in your very insightful responses. Uh, do you get much uh, not in my backyard? Uh, that certainly has been floated during this political season about protecting the suburbs. Uh, yeah, it, is that a reality it, that you face? I, you know, it, it's this is really important. And, and sadly, HUD actually had come out specifically in favor of lowering the barriers in the suburbs and making it easier to build. Mm -hmm. And then we were really disappointed to see a reversal on that. And you know, from a pro-housing perspective, the data is just wonderfully clear. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, a couple of books, if you want to 
get educated, but a little depressed, read Matt Desmond's book, Evicted, which just lays out um, that, that losing your housing actually forces you into poverty. It's not just, uh, mm -hmm. it, is a, it, it is a pathway into poverty. And the other book I think is really important is called The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. And it lays out the sort of intentional economic and racial segregation of our housing uh, by the federal government and then local government. So a lot of zoning was designed right up through the early 70s um, to be restricted by religion and race. And so I think the, we have to make it easier. And there's some really interesting experiments that don't have to, you know, it gets painted as this all or nothing. In um, Minneapolis, Austin, Texas, uh, Portland have all done big zoning changes that we were engaged with that just made it easier to build duplexes, triplexes, or quads uh, all around the city instead of single family everywhere. So just increased density in Portland, they made it easier to build uh, what they call accessory dwelling units um, in backyards and other places, which just creates a little rental unit or creates uh, more opportunities in opportunities of promise. So I think the, the data would say, um, and Raj Chetty did this huge study with his partners uh, at Stanford, um, and they, they looked at social mobility, and this is really important, and they found that low-income children who grew up in mixed-income neighborhoods Still, the American dream roughly worked. You had reasonably good opportunities to lift yourself up and, and have it. But they looked at low-income children in concentrated poverty in the United States, and there was virtually zero social mobility. It took a minor miracle to break out. And in some ways, you, it becomes self-fulfilling, right? The, the areas with more wealth get better schools get, uh, and, uh, and more opportunities and better transit and better job opportunities and, and all the rest. So. I think the, we know that mixed income is right. NIMBY is a huge issue. I joke, but it's not funny. California has perfected it. They have banana, which is build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. So they are, they are 3 million units short of, uh, of housing right now. And, you know, which is, is just uh, totally unsustainable. But I do think, you know, the cities, in some ways, the cities like Nashville that have been winning, and it's so exciting to see the economic growth and all the, energy and all the excitement in Nashville, but if you don't plan intentionally for housing to keep up with the growth, then you, you end up with a little bit of a crisis. And I think there is, suddenly there's an affordability challenge in Nashville. That is true in Atlanta that historically was affordable, uh, many places that used to be highly affordable. And so I think that, to me, it's really intriguing not to blame somebody, not to punish the builders, but to get everybody together and make the math work. So what would it take to make the math work so a good hearted developer can make a fair profit and build more units, but not uh, not only build for the wealthy. Right. This has been intellectually stimulating. It's been spiritually nourishing. It's been inspiring. I cannot thank you enough, Jonathan. Let me pray for us. And then I have one more thing I want to put on the screen, and then we'll we'll say goodbye. But thank you so much. It's been wonderful. It's great to be with you, Todd. Thanks, everyone. God, thank you so much for the time that we've had together. Thank you for. Uh, Jonathan using a lifetime of experience in the private sector and an inspiration from his uh, grandmother who served so faithfully and well uh, as a public servant. God, thank you for him bringing all that to bear on the future of Habitat for Humanity. Thank you for the systems thinking that he helps oversee. Thank you for the um, prayerful approach he takes to his, his work and his life. And God, thank you for the, the various ways that Habitat is having an impact, bringing uh, churches and other faith communities together to build, um, partnering with government and philanthropists, uh, working literally around the globe uh, with millions of people every year uh, to be an answer to their prayers that they might have a, a roof over their head. God, thank you so much for this evening. And uh, we thank you for the the hundreds uh, that will get to see this presentation in the coming weeks. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, the last uh, one I'm going to put on the board here is I don't have a question, but I truly appreciate your presentation. It was truly inspiring. Thank you. And uh, that was wonderful that they, uh, they wanted to close with that. Thanks a million, Jonathan, and thanks to everyone. Have a great evening.